what's up with me. <laughs> All right, let's get started. All right, guys, welcome back to Growth Minds. Today, we've got a very special guest on here today, Robert Kiyosaki. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us. Oh, it's uh, it's an honor. It's an honor. You know, my dad, we grew up in Korea, and mm. he, in the 1999, um, there was a recession happening in Korea right. to the point where he'd lost his job, the stable job that he had. Right. Made good enough money, but after all the things that he thought was secure, he lost it all. Right. And it just, as soon as you were talking about, you know, the difference between the poor dad and rich dad comparison, I, it was something I completely resonated with. Right. So I'm really excited to be talking to you here today. Oh, thank you. So you, you talk a lot in the book, of course, for people that, the few people that don't know, I mean, you've got 31 million copies sold now of the rich dad, poor dad? Well, 31 million registered copies, 41 million with pirated copies. Oh, I mean, we're probably talking 100 million, actually, yeah, in terms I mean, of pirated, it's, it's insane, yeah. Well, I was, just, I was just in China, I was, I was autographing books. It was like one book that was my book and five were somebody else's, <laughs> the, the, the pirates. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Counterfeiters, you know. Oh my God. That's, that's, that's life, it's business. That's how it is, I guess, yeah. now, right? Yep. Um, so you, the, the main thing that you talk about and the thing that really resonated me with is this idea of the rich mindset versus the poor mindset. Correct. And I love that you start there versus starting out with specific strategies. You really focused on the psychology of really helping people unlearn what they've been taught through society, through, through you know, in my case, family members or culture. Um, talk to us a little bit about the difference about what rich person's mindset is versus a poor mindset based on your experience. Well, that's a massive subject, but the primary reason I became an entrepreneur, and I had high paying jobs. Mm. You know, I could have sailed for Standard Oil. I was, back then I was making about 48,000 a year, which is 16, 69 was a lot of money. Yeah. And then when I, then I joined the US Marine Corps to fly in Vietnam, so I could fly. So most of my friends went to fly for United Airlines, Eastern and Northwest, and they all lost their jobs and their oh. pensions. <laughs> Wow. So I had the high paying jobs, that wasn't the issue. I became an entrepreneur for the opportunity to learn. It, I didn't have to go to nine to five at any one office, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I was free to go screw up all over the world, which I did. And so- Dominican Republic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never got there, but I met some interesting women from there. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I know Alex Rodriguez also, he's a massive entrepreneur. Yes. He, he is very committed to entrepreneurship training and all that. So that's, that's the mm. people I meet. And the young women I met from the Dominican Republic, she's an attorney, she's gorgeous, you know, all that. So that's why I'm speaking with high fond memories of the DR, <laughs> never having been there. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like you've been there basically. Yeah, yeah. Like in my dreams anyway. <laughs> so. um, gotcha, gotcha. So that was kind of the, the origin of, of how you started, um, but yeah, I mean, what what do you think for for people that pe perhaps a few people that have not read the book? What what do you feel if you can kind of highlight um, the major differences based on what you think have impacted the people the most? What do you think those are? Well, you, we started off on this is your family culture, your family values, you know, and the Asian culture. If you don't have at least a master's, and I don't have a master's, yeah, I have a I have a bachelor of science, which stands for BS. But other than that, you know, I. I only became an entrepreneur because it was the greatest challenge I could take on as far as my personal education, personal development. Yeah. And it wasn't to make money. You know? And as, as I said, my first business was a nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business and the mistake I made, I was successful. Mm. And we grew internationally so fast, I just couldn't finance my success. And so I started borrowing money, and which was good. I started to learn how to raise capital, I learned I learned how to negotiating, um, you know, in, the reason I was in Korea fighting Taekwondo was I was out there negotiating anyway for production because we were manufacturing in Hawaii where the cost of manufacturing was too too high. Sure. So I had to fly to Korea and Taiwan to negotiate manufacturing. I tell you, man, you're not stupid until you're negotiating against Koreans and Taiwanese, man. Those guys had me coming and going up one side and down the other, but that's what I did it for. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's to learn, and to learn to finance, learn how to factor, you know, how to how to ship and then factor my inventory and all this stuff. And I learned so much as I was going broke, mm. successfully going broke. 
And so when I explained to young people, that's what I did it for, that's, so that's how you get smarter. But in this academic culture, you know, we're just talking about Jordan Peterson, how he, yep. he rails up against academics. Well, the academic culture, the person who makes the most mistakes is a stupid person. But an entrepreneur, the person that makes the most mistakes and learns from them is the, smart, is the, is the rich person. So I always say to young entrepreneurs, it's not, money will never make you rich. Mm. You know, it's your experience, your, how much you've learned, the mistakes you make, the people you make. And all of those horrible experiences, they're all good experiences if you learn from them. Sure. And that's the attitudinal difference of an entrepreneur. Most guys are small business guys, they're not entrepreneurs. You know, they open a pizza shop to make money and they get stuck in that pizza shop forever. You know, yep. they go, well, that's not me. And the subject of entrepreneur is a massive sub subject. So you got this, a drug dealer peddling drugs is also an entrepreneur, as is Jeff Bezos, running the biggest product pushing country in the, company in the whole world. Mm. They're both entrepreneurs, but the gap between the drug dealer and Bezos, massive. Mm. So when I speak to young people, I say, what kind of entrepreneur do you wanna be? And it's, if you're just here to make money, so it's, you, know, you can do that, but it's not exciting. Right, right. <laughs> what, what do you think they should be focusing on other than just making money? Well, for me, it was always taxes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Isn't that technically more money, though? More yeah. money in the bank? Yeah, but the problem is, is when you, sh you know, I wrote a second book called The Cash Flow Quadrant, which is an E, employee, S, small business or self-employed or a small entrepreneur. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more. And I stands for professional insight investor. Mm. So if I'm buying stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, I'm not an insider. I'm an outsider. Mm. So my goal from my rich dad, not my poor dad, was to make it to the B quadrant. So I have 500 employees, but more importantly, to be an I quadrant investor. Those guys on Shark Tank, like Damon Johns and Cuban and those guys, they're, they're Bs and Is. Yeah. The average small guy is an E and an S. And there's a very big difference in taxes. Mm. So I wanted to learn the tax law. So I can, so I had my friend Donald Trump and I wrote a book, two books together. I know he's hated, I know he's hated, but we wrote two books together and we make millions and pay no taxes legally. Hmm. That was the objective. And the idea is you have a corporation where you can deduct a lot of expenses. No, you have to be very, very smart. I mean, that you don't deduct expenses. You have to be both a B big business, yeah. and an I, an insight. So I invest in the inside. I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or ETFs. Mm. So the reason I, my education began when I left the Marine Corps, I was, I was flying out of Kaneohe, Hawaii. And then, um, so when I was watching an infomercial TV, I was still in the Marine Corps making, back, back then about 700 a month as a Marine Lieutenant. And I said, you too can make money in real estate. So my rich dad says, you better learn real estate because that's the game. So other than stocks, the real estate is the only game where you don't pay taxes. Sure. And the average person doesn't understand that because they're flippers. If you flip a house, you're paying taxes. So I don't flip either. So that was all part of the learning process of, it was like going down the maze, you know, this tunnel and that tunnel and this tunnel. Sure. So today when I make, let's say a million dollars in my rich dad company, I go to the bank and I'll borrow five minutes. My five millions, I got a five to one leverage. And with, with today's interest rates, is fantastic. Crazy. Yeah. And because I'm leveraging up my real estate, I pay no taxes because of depreciation, amortization, and appreciation. Mm. So that's the stuff I was learning from my rich dad. Whereas yeah. my poor dad said, get your MBA. And I lasted, I think, three months in the MBA program. And then one day I woke up in the class and <laughs> My notes were all blurred. I was still flying for the Marine Corps. I'm getting spit on by all the college students, you know, oh, baby yeah. killer and all this stuff. And I wake up in the class, it was the accounting class, and my notes were all blurred because I drooled all over them. <laughs> I said, I'm not learning a damn thing here. <laughs> that was the last day of school for me. Jesus, Because wow. I learned accounting working for Rich as an apprentice, just like Trump, yeah. we're apprentices. So I knew real accounting versus the fake accounting they teach in business school. Yeah, yeah. Which is the real accounting is how do you how do you make sure you make a lot of money and pay no taxes? That's it. That's, that's it. the game. Yep, yeah. And that's that was one of my valuable courses certainly in university. But we were just talking off air. Grew up with very conservative parents. Right. Went to McGill. Good university. Great school. Yeah. Great school. Yeah. And just didn't resonate. So I actually ended up dropping out. And I know your first book was talking about 
people dropping out and the education system, how flawed it was, right? Oh, it's, it's criminal. Yes. It's criminal that, you know, they're taking so much money from your generation that, you know, student loan debt is now bigger than the subprime mortgage debt. And to put young people in debt like that, they should take every college professor out there and shoot them at dawn. I'm a Marine, you know, that's what we do to criminals. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Yeah, yeah, but it's course. criminal what they're doing. You realize yeah. Harvard with their endowments could, could hand out free education for 150 years and not charge a thing. But instead they take the best and the brightest and load them with debt if their families can't pay for it, then they're, they're screwed. On top of that, they'll learn nothing about money. Yep. There's a book, Tailspin, by, I forget his name, he's, oh. but anyway, he, he's a Yale, Yale graduate plus Yale, Yale Law, yeah. and he writes about how our Yale is teaching young minds to create derivatives. They're not teaching them finance. And you know, derivatives are what uh, Buffett calls financial weapons of mass destruction. And we're still producing one point, you know, today we're 1.4 trillion, trillion, no, quadrillion in derivatives. On top of that, the young people are deeply in debt. Right. And there's still no financial education in our schools. And it's unlike criminal. corporations, when, <coughs> when a student defaults or they go into bankruptcy, they still owe the school's money, right? It's when the worst type that. of debt you can possibly get into because there's no escape. See, what if I, I got crucified for this, but I have one bankruptcy on my record, but it was a corporate bankruptcy. I yeah. have 27 companies. So one out of 27 going bankrupt, I thought was pretty good. But of course, a journalist, that's all they focus on. You know, you have a bankruptcy. And I said, let me tell you something, numb brains. There's a personal bankruptcy and there's business bankruptcies. No, but you have a bankruptcy, you know, yeah. I'm going. Yeah, that's all they care about, right? But they don't know any difference. Yeah. You know, and I agree with Buffett. He says, if you have stupid journalists, you have stupid people. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Look and that's up. why I love Jordan Peterson, because he's attacking the academics. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I love at, that guy. Look at the headlines right now with Corona and everything that's uh, happening, it's crazy. God, no, but, but you know what I mean? Our, our academic systems are out of touch with the real world. That's yeah. my complaint. Yeah. And next to one of my best projects, a, a student loan provider is building this project that makes my place look small. I mean, they're building this massive, massive, all built on collecting and servicing student loans. It's massive. Yeah. And they're SOBs to work with. I mean, they're my neighbors, but they think because of all this money coming in from students, they can bully me around. Mm. Well, I'm a real estate guy, we just fight back. You know, they, they encroach on my easements and my boundaries. Well, you know, we got more money, then we can fight you all day long. I said, fight me. But this, they're student loan guys, which makes me hate them even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is in Phoenix. I won't mention the name because it's still my neighbors. With the trouble with real estate, you can't choose your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> you can always move out, I guess. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, this, this is the major problem with, with the education system. It's, it's so outdated that, I mean, I've heard that the current Amer American education system was actually modeled after the 18th century uh, within Prussia. Yes. Right? And I think it had some also influence, like I mean, the whole idea is that the, the American system is currently nicknamed the factory model of education. Correct. And that we're just manufacturing. Employees. Employees and people, they're, out, they're almost discouraging people to think in a creative way in a world that will thrive with creativity because everything's gonna be automated in a way. It's just insane. It is insane. The, the several things that I, I find, one more time, second book, Cash Flow Quadrant, ES, on the right side is B and I, and that's again, that's where guys like Mark Cuban and Damon Johns come from. You know, they're, they're professional investors, they acquire companies, they finance companies. They have what's called family offices, not, not home businesses or family home offices. They're family offices, so I have a family office. So when I, when I was a young man, my rich dad said to me, someday you want a family office. Hmm. I said, what does that mean? I oh got an office. He goes, no, 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 no. It's where you have a whole team of people moving your money for you because you got so much money coming in. I say too much money is a problem also because you gotta keep moving it. So I have a family office. And that was part of the, the whole process of becoming rich was so I could learn to have a family office. And the average guy has a 401k. Mm. Why am I kicking his butt? I don't care if he went to Harvard. 
you know, I'll kick his butt up one side and down the other, making millions, not paying taxes, but keep moving my money. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so that's education. That's what I learned. Do you recommend, because um, there are schools, obviously, that are not as expensive in America. If you look at Europe, there are, there are schools that are relatively cheap. Canada is still very expensive, but it's certainly not to that level of the U.S. So from like a cost perspective, if it is a lower cost, do you recommend, are there specific types of people that should still go to school and benefit from that if it is a lower cost? or should they just avoid it altogether? No, 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 that's a very good question because the question is what do you want to become? You want to be an employee, go to school, go to mm. McGill, go to Harvard, go to Stanford, you know? Yeah. You want to be an entrepreneur, I don't know where you go. So the, re the way I learned that was when I graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy right here on Long Island, we're the highest paid graduates in the world. Back then there were still ships on, at sea, now that all the ships are gone because of our our wages are too high. Right. So back in 1969, when I graduated, I was making 47,000 a year. Back then, it was huge That was money. a lot, yeah. And then my, my other class is making 120 a year because they were, they were driving bomb carriers into Vietnam. And so they were in the zone for I think 18 months and was all tax free. So you're a 22 year old kid making 120K a year tax free. You, you did two or three trips, you were finished. You know, two or three years, you're out. But I went to Standard Oil. And then I went to fly for the Marine Corps because the war was still, long. I saw Vietnam and I said, geez, I wanna participate in this one, you know, because mm -hmm. I was draft exempt because I was sailing for an oil company. Oil is draft exempt. So I joined the US Marine Corps, I went to flight school, and that's when I realized the value of education. Yeah. See, if you're gonna be a pilot, go to flight school. If you're gonna be a doctor, go to medical school going to be a dentist, go to dental school. Where do you go if you want to be an entrepreneur? You know, because, and the other thing too is, when I was in flight school, you could already tell the good instructors because the good instructors had just come back from Vietnam. They were up to date. Yeah, They were saying, the, the damn Viet Cong, they changed this, they changed that, and so they were, and so the US Marine Corps and Navy syllabus was sending down, you should fly this way. This guy said, don't you fly that way, you'll be dead tomorrow. Because the Viet Cong was changing, we had to change. So just one example, we used to, I was a gunship pilot, we'd come in at 1500 and roll in. And then the Russians gave the Viet Cong was thing called an SA-7. You know, it's called a, it's called a Strela in Vietnam and the, the Taliban used it against the Russians in, in Afghanistan. Yeah. So if you came in at 1500 with this new technology called the SA-7 or the Strela, you were dead meat. You were coming in too high. Big saw a Viet Cong with absolutely no training at all, just point, pull, the trigger. This, this heat sinker went up right up your tube, blew you out of the sky. So we're in, we're in flight school learning how to fire guns and rolling in from high, and these instructors are coming back, you do that, you're gonna be dead. And that's where I learned the value of technology and education and the best teachers. Sure. So suddenly the teachers were telling us to come in at 1500 feet on a gun and rocket run, and we were saying, you're gonna be dead. And so they were trained to come at what's called defilade. We had to fly below tree level. Mm. So everything was changing so fast and that's when I really understood education better than anything else, is education supposed to prepare you for the real world. And what's the real world of an academic? The... Yeah, it's all theory. Yeah. 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 <coughs> and, and they don't have the skills for the real world. Mm. They want tenure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the difference. Yeah, I think I think there are some initiatives that are slowly starting to pop up. It's it's still very in its infancy stage. Like Thiel Fellowship, the billionaire Peter Thiel, he's got this program where he provides students one hundred thousand dollars that are entrepreneurs to start their own business. I went through something similar in Canada where they provide uh, money, investors, co-founders to start your own company. Good, good yeah. And that's why I dropped out, but it's still so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, I followed your advice, Rob. Smart <laughs> man. <laughs> you know, put it into practice. But uh, you know, it's it's um, it's still so far behind. It's still so far behind. Well, that's the thing I'm saying is that ENS, you know, employee and so small business, self-employed, or a doctor or a lawyer specialist. Yeah, the mindsets are different. BNI, completely different mindsets. 
So on the B and the I side, you have to have a team. So it's so on the B and the I side, I must have a bookkeeper because the most accurate, the most important thing I have are accurate records. Rich Dad Poor Dad is a book on accounting. That's all it is. It's a book on accounting with no numbers, just pictures. And that, that's why I made so much money on 31 it. Thirty-one million copies yeah. later. <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah. trick, huh? <laughs> There's anyway, lots of pictures. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm I'm a doodler. I doodled in school, so, <laughs> so I'm still doodling in my book. But anyway, so um, on the B and the I side, you have to have the best teams. So I go onto the field. You know, I, I have a friend who is an attorney, very smart attorney. He cannot figure out why I make like. 50 times more money than he does and I don't work. But he's a hard working attorney. And I go, well, number one, you're, tax, you're in the wrong tax bracket. And number two, you're a lone wolf. Mm. I'll kick your ass all day long. Mm. You know, that's like going on to the football field and taking on the uh, Patriots, you know? <laughs> yeah, can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on the, on the <coughs> tax bracket for people that may not be aware of what you're talking about? Yeah, if, if you're an employee across the world, it's the average tax bracket is 40%, so you make $100,000. That means 40K is going to the government. If you're a small business, an S quadrant, 60% goes. Mm. So these guys have become small entrepreneurs, they wind up in 60% brackets. <coughs> you can edit all that out, right? I'm coughing. Okay. So you go, there are 60% bracket. So my objective was to get to the I and the B and the I. So on the B side, when, you're, when you have 500 employees or more, you pay 20% in taxes. So that's why you know, we're here in New York City. When Amazon was looking to move to New York, they were gonna give them all the tax breaks possible. Now you're, you're you know, Joe Schmo, the uh, computer programmer, they're not gonna give you any tax break at all. You, know, you pay the high taxes. Pay more, yeah. And then the I quadrant is a professional investor, the insider, the inside guy. And the number one asset is real estate. That's the game, it's debt and taxes. Mm. So every time I make money in the B quadrant as a business owner, as a 20% bracket, I then move my money into real estate and I pay no taxes. Yep. And that's the game. So I get the whole tax system of capitalism is designed to make you richer. But our schools will never teach you that, which is the battle today between you have academics who are E's and S's for most sakes, then you have the B's and the I's. Their skill sets, their mindsets, their beings, their spirits are different. So like, you know, when, when they kick Basil's out of here, no problem, he just moved. Yeah. So for an entrepreneur that wants to one day start their business and they understand now because you hear that the school system that they're currently in is not gonna provide them that, or their, let's say a parent is watching and they know that, you know, their, their student is gonna be part of the STEM field, let's say. W what should they do? Should they go out there and drop out like I did and try to start their business and take that risk? What are the ways to transition off of that? Well, that's the reason I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then the quadrant. So it gave guys like you kind of a roadmap. I mean, there's so many different ways you can make get there. And then the third book is Rich Dad's Guide to Investing, the I quadrant. See, the I quadrant's the key. And as a professional investor, I use the I quadrant to, um, to analyze businesses. Mm. Like I just invested in an education company. And somebody, are you a trader? What's wrong with you? Why are you investing in an education company? I said, who funds education companies? And I go, I don't know. I said, the government. <laughs> so that's why these uh, charter schools and all that, they're pretty good investments. Mm. Because your source of income is the government. Because you know the, the whole constitution says every child must have an education. So they might be teaching them garbage, but I like the source of funds. Because <laughs> you're on the other side. I'm of only the, kidding. Because you're on the other side of the table, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just sitting there going, what am I looking at? I, I want, you know, if the entrepreneur has no skills and say, you know, I've got a PhD, but I can't sell, I can't negotiate, I don't have any professional skills and all this. I don't care if a PhD, I'm not gonna invest in you. But if you, you say to me, the federal government is gonna give you a million dollars a month to teach kids, suddenly I like you a lot. <laughs> Because it's the federal government. That's a true, a true capitalist money. Yeah. here, right? I'm, I'm not that mercenary, but no, I'm pretty close. It. I'm I pretty close it. to that. And then I'm, I'm just going to invest that money in real estate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about money. Um, so we talked about this idea of the rich mindset. We understand how broken the education model is because it's, it's a lot of it, as we mentioned, modeled back to the 18th century of, of Prussia and, and the factory system. It, it was two, uh, what you're talking about it had two purposes. One, to train employees and second to train soldiers. 
Mm. People would just do as they're told without thinking. Right. Was that because they were fighting Prussia and they realized how efficient the soldiers were in the war and they wanted to model after that? Well, they were taking farmers. Right. You see, the whole thing was, went agrarian industrial to their technology. So back then, they were trying to get these farmers who were pretty independent little guys and they work for themselves, so they're trying to train them from farmers or S quadrant, self-employed, to employees mm. or soldiers. Right. People who would do as they're told. Right, and the education system hasn't been updated since that time, basically. No, it's, a, it's actually gone backwards, in my opinion. Hmm. In what way? Well, they're misinforming and miseducating. Look, the, the, th the biggest thing for an entrepreneur is you've got to learn how to make mistakes. And they, t and they school punishes you for making mistakes. Second, you have to operate in a team. You know, everybody talks about team, except in school, if you take tests as a team, you're called cheaters. <laughs> yeah. So just those two mind constructs, mm. the average guy goes out there afraid of making a mistake and starts a business and they make mistakes, obviously. Then they don't have a team. Gotcha, gotcha. And they're, they're, the odds are stacked against them. Yep. So, I started, my wife and I started with a bookkeeper. Why a bookkeeper? Because the number one thing an entrepreneur must have is accurate records. I've made so many guys show up and they said, where are your records? They want me to fund their company. They don't have any records. They have no numbers. I said, how do I know if you're good or bad? Well, no, man, it's a good concept. <laughs> We're doing a lot We're of We're gonna good. change the world. Yeah. This is like a revolutionary <laughs> concept. We're good people. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a I have a master's in art. Yeah. We're from the same city, you know? I know, yeah. You know? We grew up together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had this one guy, oh it was painful, my uh -oh. classmate. Hawaiian guy, you know, and Hawaiians have a different culture than the Japanese culture. And what he happened? says he he wanted two million dollars. I says, For what? He says, Because all of my kids are unemployed. No, that wasn't the real reason, yeah. was it? He says they've all lost their jobs. So you wanted just loan money? No. I was supposed to give him the money because we're family. That's awkward. <laughs> no, no, but this, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on the Hawaiians. Yeah. The, um, they call, what, are those, what are they called? The, the people from, oh, Egypt. What are they called, these guys who are, I don't forget. Their culture is if you have something, it's mine. Uh, I forget what they what's, what are they called? They're, they're um, gypsies. Uh, uh, my, my, my friend is a gypsy, and he says in the gypsy culture that if you have two, one is theirs. <laughs> and I'm going, what? <laughs> but then I started thinking about my friends, you know, my classmates who are hardcore Hawaiians, they're great people. Mm -hmm. They can sing and dance and all this, but family is everything. And so if his family's hurting and I have extra, it's up to me because we're all part of the same family to help each other. Is that like an expectation that yeah, he has? Yeah, it's cultural. And that's what really hurts most entrepreneurs. It's like we, we started a whole conversation. What's your family culture? What were your family's belief systems? What were their values? You know, and, un, and they all play a factor inside your success in so-called the real world outside of the family. Mm. And I'm not blaming my friend who's Hawaiian because, you know, they the thing is his culture was different than mine. Yeah. Same as my fam my culture is different than my own family. You know, my, my brothers and sisters all have master's degrees and all that. And I'm going <laughs> <laughs> they send their kids to college and going, Whoa, oh, have a good time, you know. But yeah. they still believe Japanese still believe in college and saving money and job security. Yeah. And well, becoming a government employee. Sure. I'd rather shoot myself. Yeah, I mean, Japanese and, because uh, we had Stevie Oki. Are you familiar with Stevie Oki at all? No. He's like a big DJ guy, younger guy, but in his 40s now, but also Japanese. That's really young. <laughs> and <laughs> Half my age. <laughs> you look 40 up. Uh -huh. But he also resonated the same thing. Koreans are the same way, right? <coughs> We're probably one of the most conservative societies when it comes to that because we grew up in the, you know, in Korea, they call it the Chebol. I think yep. in Japan, what yep. do they call it? I don't know. The, uh, the, the big anyway, it's a conglomerate days, right? Where a right. couple of companies own the entire Correct. economy there, and they're just so <coughs> used to, they're just so used to living in that world. Um, well, so the Japanese had a thing called kumiai. Kumiai. Okay. Kumiai was that if you lived in the same neighborhood in Hawaii and you li and 
you were Japanese. All the Japanese stuck together. Mm. And my father, who was six foot four, for Japanese is pretty big. The kumi I would come and you know talk to our family about the Japanese sticking together. My father threw him out. And these are ja other ja he says, "Look, we're Americans. Get that in your head right now." You know, so I had I had this conflicting cultural values. Sure, sure. So again, for the, every entrepreneur, first thing you must inspect is what was your cultural heritage. Not that it's right or wrong, mm. but with the values. Did you just struggle with that when you were growing up oh, in, in high school? Hey, when I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad, I was I must went to the devil for that one. You know, because Japanese, you don't ever criticize your father. Same as Chinese. I mean, Korean and Chinese, right? Father is the king. Yeah. It's very patriarchal. Yeah. So when I was asked, well, how do you feel about writing a book about your father? I said, well, he's dead. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to wait for him to die before I wrote the book okay. because he would have killed me. Okay. My family was ready to kill me. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, how did you, how did you overcome that? <laughs> it's because Jesus. I said he's dead. And that didn't go over well either. <laughs> oh my God. Were you close to them though when you were growing up? Yeah, I had a great father. My, both my rich dad and my poor dad were great men. Yeah, but they both two, respect. They're two opposite guys. You know, the one guy really believed in school, but he didn't know what he didn't know. Mm. And my rich dad never went to school, and, you know, he didn't know what he didn't know. But the two made kind of a whole education. So one was a capitalist, one was a socialist. Yeah. And so then we have Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump and, I don't know, all this other stuff going yeah. on. It's, it's kind of hysterical. Let's, you let's, step back, when you step back, you look at it from values, you know? I mean, you got two in the race now, right? Joe Biden and uh, Bernie Sanders. Well, do you realize that if I ran for office, I'd be younger than all of them? <laughs> it's crazy. It's great. They're all old. It's crazy. No wonder Biden can't remember things. I can't remember how to get in a taxi anymore. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we also had Andrew Yang on in New York when how he was running. How is he? I've, He's doing good. He's he just announced something that he's starting called Move Humanity Forward. I, a lot of people thought he was running for mayor actually for New York, really? which he still might. I'm not sure. I don't think he's announced it, but he's starting a nonprofit basically. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> you know what nonprofit stands for? No. Tax exempt. That's what it really means. <laughs> yeah, you know, probably. It yeah. means that they can't make money, so they're gonna. F you know, I, I know the game. I sit there and chuckle and laugh all the time. <laughs> Well, I can introduce you to Andrew if you want. Yeah, I don't understand how they can pay everybody. You know, I fought for capitalism. Mm. You know, I, I realize it's 80-20. You know, it's called Pareto's Law. Pareto's Law yep. is an 80-20 rule, right? It's something like that. So 20% of the people need socialism. They need to be taken care of. But 80% can make money on their own. So why would I give somebody with the capabilities to be the 80% give them money? Sure. It doesn't make sense to me. What did you think about the UBI? I'm assuming you've seen the same Well, same I think, uh, unfortunately, it's coming just because our school system is teaching people to be victims. Mm. You know, I don't know if you saw me on uh, Patrick Ben David. You know, that guy's a, that guy's a genius, man. I love working with him. He's smart, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is he smart. He's, he kind of, I used to work with Tony Robbins, and mm. he has that quickness of brain. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little Hawaiian, a little slower. But anyway, <laughs> he goes, he goes uh, I told him, I said, you know, during the agrarian age, the church was the center. So every small town had a church. So it was very spiritual and that was a culture. We shifted the industrial age and then weaponry came up. So we could now kill. You know, they went, it went from swords to guns, to machine guns, to rockets, to drones, you know. So during the industrial age, they started building statues to war heroes. So that was, a, you know, as a Marine, they had the Marines raising, raising the flag on Iwo Jima and they have, Robert E. Lee and Grant, and mm. so everybody, everybody respected war heroes and stuff like that. Now they're tearing down Robert E. Lee and Grant and all these guys because America is now worshiping the victim. Victim mentality. The victim mentality. That's what I said on Patrick Bet David. And a couple of my friends called me and said, you're an asshole, and I said, well, you're entitled to your opinion, but I've been called better, you know, <laughs> and stuff like this. But I said, we're raising victims. Our schools are pumping out victims. And the reason I like this guy, uh, Jordan uh, Peterson, is he says, it's not what a person stands for. You see that? He, he did this great thing. It's what are they against? He says, a lot of times they'll stand up there and say, well, I stand for socialism, but they're really against the rich. 
And so that's why when you talk about Andrew Yang and uh, Pete Buttigieg and all this stuff, I wonder what they really stand for. Hmm. What, are, what are they really fighting for? So I'm, I'm up front with you. I'm fighting for capitalism. Yeah. You know, I fight for education, that, it, that we should have better education. I'm not saying anything else inside that. I don't have a hidden agenda. Sure, sure. So when these guys are talking about we're going to fix the homeless, I said, uh, what does that mean? And so what uh, Jordan Peterson says, they're, says they're against the rich. Mm. They're not for the homeless. They're against the rich. And that's where most of the people on the left are. And I don't know that because I'm not political, not Republican or Democrat. You don't have any re religious agenda. You know, you want to believe in God, fine. Don't want to believe in God, fine. But it's I want to know what you really stand for, not what you pretend to be standing for. Yeah. So yeah. when Andrew Yang says he's going to start a nonprofit as a capitalist, I already know he can't raise capital. <laughs> because look, I am, I'm doing the same thing, but I can raise capital. You know, I'm I'm a hardcore teacher. Yeah. What do you think is the difference between you and Andrew Yang in that case? You can't raise capital. I'm not an entrepreneur. So what's the skill sets I'm missing? I don't know. He better he better figure that one out pretty quickly. Look, understand something. I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual funds. You know why? Why? I can make up my own assets. Hmm. I wrote this book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, 31 million copies. I make $5 a book. You do the math on that one. I create my cash flow game. I think I make six, six, six or $7 a game sure. in 50 languages. I know how to sell. Yeah, but don't you have to invest that money once you make it so that it's in the less risky asset I don't, class? I don't even need money. That's the worst part. The next book I'm coming out with is called The Infinite Return. Is that when you have the mindset of a capitalist, you don't need money. Okay. See, rule number one in Rich Dad Poor Dad is the rich don't work for money. Most people miss that one. But that goes back to 1971 when Nixon took us off the gold standard. Yeah. And money became fake money. Yeah. So anyway, um, my rich dad was preparing me to think about how can I make money without, make mo without money. And the way I do it, I create an asset, like a book. I'm not saying write books because that's a tough industry. But I write a book today. I sell 50 licenses to 50 different languages, and I, co I collect royalties for years, the mm. long tail. Yeah. So my money just keeps coming in. From with that, I, I borrow, so let's say I make $10 in a book, I'll borrow $50 to invest in real estate. I step up my basis for depreciation, amortization, and uh, appreciation. Gotcha. That's financial education. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That garbage they teach you about invest for the long term of the stock market, why would I do that? when I can make up my own assets. Yeah. You know, that's what entrepreneurs do. Every entrepreneur should be making up their own assets and staying out of the stock market. That's my point of view. But can everybody do it? No, of course not. Sure. But you, I've, I've screwed up enough times to prove I can do it. <laughs> and my accountant will back me up. Yeah, the guy is an idiot, <laughs> but he does create assets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you have this great core competency, which is the ability to communicate something that's very complicated or what has been made complicated because why simple. would people go to school and pay for that money if it yeah. sounds simple? So you made it really comp simple using pictures and everything. Right. And you've been able to find leverage. They'd say that you can find leverage through people, capital, or especially now it's media and software. Yeah. And you've been able to do all three of those. Yeah. And trade, you know, Rich has a brand, man. Yeah. What that was worth. Yeah. No, it's impressive what you've done. It's yeah. amazing. But I can sell. And yeah. that's why my first job when I left the Marine Corps was to join Xerox so I could learn how to sell because of being Japanese, right? I was really shy. Yeah. And I, I could kill people from the sky. I was a Marine, I was, you know, decorated hero and all this crap. But I couldn't pick up a girl in the bar. <laughs> and when I said that to my rich dad, he says, your sex life sucks, doesn't it? And I said, oh, it's terrible. He says, because you can't sell. You can't sell. <laughs> and so he says, if you don't sell, you're never, you're going to be lonely and horny all your life. <laughs> So that kind of inspired me to learn how to sell. Yeah, yeah. So I joined Xerox, you know what I mean? And, but you have to do what it takes. Mm. So Andrew Yang is a good, smart, very smart guy. He can't sell. He doesn't know how to create an asset so somebody will give him the money. Then he doesn't know how to invest that money so he pays no tax on it. That's why he has to go to, he has to go to the tax exempt or the, what do you call that? I don't know what he called us. I don't even think, I don't think in their words. Well, he has been able to raise insane amounts of money for... As, as tax deferred, you know what I mean? For tax, for yeah. tax advantages. I see what you're saying, yeah. He's yeah. just in the wrong system. No, I mean, he's he, doing good for, his, for himself. Yes. But as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm kind of in the same... You talk about UBI, right? Yeah. Universal Basic Income. We're on the opposite sides of the camp, but I understand why he does it. 
If you're an entrepreneur, you don't need a UBI. You don't even need a job. Think about that. See, that's where you're going right now. You will eventually never need a job and you'll never need money if you keep pushing the boundaries of your mental abilities. Mm. That's called the infinite return. Yeah. When I write a book, I have no money in the deal and I collect money for the rest of my life. The royalties. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, royalty, I mean, that's what Richard Branson did, basically, yep. by licensing that's his That's what Trump brand. does also. That's what Trump does as well. That's what yeah. Bezos does also. How does Bezos do that? Well, he has a company that he has all these millions of people working for him. The money keeps oh, coming see. in. You see, and he then, and then he floats, it. A, he floats it on the stock market, which is all free money. He wouldn't become a billionaire if he was selling just Amazon. He, took, he floated it on, on Wall Street. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's, what, that's the game. It's on the B and the I side, not the yeah. E and the S side. Absolutely. So let, let's get into, because <laughs> we're talking about Jeff Bezos, we're talking about Trump. Let's, let's get into the average middle class person that is perhaps starting this, they're learning your concepts, they're getting benefit from it, but they're not making hundreds of million dollars yet, right? Someone that's 25 probably has fifty to $100,000 in savings. For someone that has that amount of money, how do you think they should invest it? Well, I, I mean, everybody's different. That's what I'm saying. The first, the first inspection, that's why one of the guys I like is Eckhart Tolle, T-O-L-L-E, and, all, and Mike Singer. Now. It's all these new guys, that they're the new spiritualists coming out. They're like the new Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, you know? And I think you have to have a spirituality to you. It's, I'm not saying, okay. if, if religion does it for you, fine, you know? But it, it never worked for me. I, I flunked out of Sunday school also. But anyway, there's a point where you have to have some faith in your abilities right, and guidance. And so I know if I do what I consider the right thing, well, what would you do if you were 25 today and you had $50,000 in the bank? Would you invest it back into yourself with your education? Because that amount of money is not going to do that much like yeah. damage in the market or uh, real estate. I, or or is it, and is, is it different if you had $500,000? No. Is, no. Idiots are idiots, you know. That's why, you know, most guys, was it every, most major league athletes are broke within six years or something? They lose everything. Sure. Or a lottery winner. Yeah, because money never makes you rich. And so the thing is to invest in your life experiences, your mentors. So the story of rich dad, poor dad is choosing between two different teachers. Mm. You know, if I followed my poor dad, I'd probably be a government employee in Hawaii, you know, or a tenured teacher. Yeah. So it's, it's a hard choice. You gotta choose your teachers wisely and your life experiences. Like we were talking about, I, I took, you know, three companies public through Toronto. I mean, through first with VC. Vancouver Stock Exchange, and I had to uh, mi migrate to the Toronto Stock Exchange. Why did I do that? To learn, learn to how how to raise capital on public markets. Now the average entrepreneur never does that. You know, they keep open their pizza shop and they open two pizza shops. And that's that's about it, because mm. they're into just for the money. I wanted to learn something, so I I took my first um, first was an oil company in Portugal. And I took that public, and everybody told me there's no oil in Portugal, and I found out the hard way. They're right. <laughs> there's no oil there. I, that company crashed and burned like a airplane coming out of the sky, you know. And then the next thing, I started a silver company in Argentina, and we struck silver, and we did very well. Yeah. And then I started a gold company in China, mm. and the Chinese took it. So uh, <laughs> Jesus. those are priceless experiences. You know, yeah. Aren't you bitter? I go, yeah, but... That's what I did it for. You understand that? I did it for that. Mm. So you're saying people that have, let's say, 50,000, 100,000, they should just go out there. Look for a teacher and, and look for experiences. So education, yeah. take risks. Real life make, experiences. Make mistakes. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Don't worry about like making 10% in the stock market, you're saying, with that no, money. No, that's a waste of time. I mean, uh, uh, it depends on you. I don't sure. need stock market to make money. I got that to raise capital, but not to make money. Mm -hmm. So there's all, all there's so much to learn. That's that's the biggest problem. So like I said, you know, the guy pushing drugs on the street, he's no different than Jeff Bezos with Amazon, just the scale. <laughs> right, one's legal, one's not. Right? No, no, one's no. Those guys bigger than Bezos and drugs. Mm. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. And I run into them. Do you? Oh yeah. How? Oh. The world's filled with those guys. So as you travel. Yeah, you just, you just bump in. My father ran for a political office. He ran for lieutenant governor, the poor dad. The first person you have to kiss, kiss the ring on is the crime, criminals. 
in wet in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you know the the governor of Hawaii is a guy named uh, uh, Burns, John Burns. His partner was I think uh, something, but they were partners. Yeah. Both police officers. One was on the side of the government. One was on the side of the crime. That's the that's the game. Sure. I think people better wake up that. The mafia and those guys, they're real characters. I mean, they really are in business all over the world. Yeah. You know, and if you think they're not, then you're living in dreamland. So my father had to kiss the ring of this guy, Nappy Palava, who was the head of one, one Hawaiian syndicate in Hawaii. And you gotta play the game. Politics is a dirty, dirty game. Sure. Dirty, dirty game. There's yeah. a book called Sunny Sky Shady Characters and it's about the, cr the, cr the crime syndicates of Hawaii. You know, my father, the reason I, I recommend to all my friends is in Hawaii, because that's what my father was talking about. You know, in Hawaii, the Supreme Court justices, they got caught too. The mm. Supreme Court justices of Hawaii, these highly esteemed men, got caught up in all this crime yeah. through Kamehameha schools. Yeah. Criminal operations, all of that's them. Crazy, yeah. So I'm not saying I'm a pessimist. I'm saying just be aware, you know? That's like saying, oh, why can't we all hold hands and sing Kumbaya? We'll get rid of the police. We'll get rid of the military. We'll all live together. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. That, you know, that, and I think that's what the left is trying to, you know, I'm not Republican, Democrat. People live in dreamland, you know? Wake up. This is a real world, and there's people going to steal, steal. Another book I'm going to write is Hiring Thieves. <laughs> Jesus. I can't believe how many how times I've had employees steal from me. I'm going, my God, I couldn't do it. Not that I'm a saint, not that I'm going on the short list for saints, but several times I've lost a lot of money because I hired the people that steal from me. Have you improved how you read people? It's almost impossible, but you have to. I mean, the, it's my fault. I mean, I, I take full responsibility because, you know, I, I didn't, you know, as Reagan said, trust but verify. Yeah. The trouble is the people verify with the guys they didn't, I should have not trusted. Oh, I see. <laughs> that the so you, started, I, you started the wrong foot, basically. Well, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like the first guy that stole all my money was my accountant in my nylon wallet business, mm. Stanley, my CPA. Uh -oh. And he was so afraid that we we're going to go down, and we did go down, but he wanted to get his money out first. So I raised 100000 extra. I brought in, this was years and years ago as a kid. And Stanley says, I said to Stanley, I said, Stanley, will this help, does this solve the problem? He goes, yeah. I forgot to define whose problem it solved. <laughs> Stanley's problem, and he ran off with it. Now again, yeah. it was the best thing that happened to me because I woke up. Mm. And I think for young people, I think that's really the thing. Keep waking up, keep learning. On the good side, you meet some of the best people on earth. Like my team of uh, advisors right now, we all came about because of bad partnerships. Like Kenny McElroy, he, we've made millions together in real estate. I met him through a bad partner. And he and I started talking and said, Just how can we be so stupid? Because we're so stupid with the same partner, if you know what I mean? Sure. But we met each other and said, well, let's not do that to each other. And we've made millions. It's amazing. Do you yeah. Know? So there's, there's always a silver lining, but you've got to look for it and be aware there's people who do not really subscribe to your philosophies. Sure. And they come from different backgrounds. Yeah, I mean, after, after university, I went straight to Argentina. I had no idea this was happening. It's getting worse now, but there are locals telling me that they woke up one day That's and cool. money, money in the bank I disappeared. I Zip. took, you know, my kid brother, he lives in Hawaii, he's the greatest guy, you know. I took him to Argentina because he <laughs> wouldn't wake up. So we're out there in Argentina. I introduced my friend. My friend was an engineer, you know, about probably about young, a little younger than my brother and I. And he says, I, I was a millionaire in Argentina with U.S. dollars. And one day I woke up, <coughs> and the money was gone. And so the bank said, oh, don't worry. We'll give you a million back in pesos. <laughs> so my brother sat there, and he says, is this why you brought me here? I said, yeah, wake up. Wake up, yeah. Because you're Japanese. Japanese save money. And J Japan is the most screwed up country financially because they're all highly educated savers. When are you going to wake up? You know, Japan's debt to GDP, I think, is like 240% right now. Wow. 
it's the worst in the whole world. Wow. They all save money. If the Japanese didn't save money, you know, Japan would be gone. And my friends inside Japan say the banks now lend debtors money so the debtor can pay the bank back. Mm. So what happens, the debtor gets deeper in debt, but the bank looks like everybody's paying their bills. <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't know what the, the Japanese have a word for it, bakatari. Which is? You're an idiot. <laughs> And the Japanese are very good people, you know, high, hardworking, diligent, and all this. They have no financial education. They believe in saving money. The Yakuza is their mafia that runs rampant through that place. Yeah. And they still pretend. Yeah. Well, saving money in this day and age, I mean, I think Warren Buffett's got $130 billion in cash right now waiting because there is probably going to be some sort of a recession. People say it's a correction right now because of the corona. But it's a rough time. What are your thoughts on all this? Well, I love crashes. You know, like um, <clears throat> the best time to get rich is in a crash. The problem is this time I think this crash might last a long time. The 1929 crash lasts 25 years. That's how long it lasted. I think this one, this one might be at least 20 years, this next depression, because the, 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 num the numbers are so astronomical. Like I said, if Japan is 260% debt to GD, 240% America's 115% debt to GDP. That's how much, and increasing a, a trillion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. How are we gonna pay it back? And then, you know, my book here, Who Stole My Pension? The pensions are bankrupt. That defined benefit pensions for school teachers, firefighters, and police officers, estimate between nine to 14 trillion dollars underfunded. Mm. What's gonna happen that's when crazy. that goes down? You know, so that's why I sit and I watch, and I go, this one might be a long one. And just today, as we're talking, the, 10 year went below nine per, went below 1%. You can't keep printing money. It's never worked in history, yeah. at least as far as I know. So that's what I watch. On the other side of it, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur because if you're smart, you have a good spirit, and you, <clears throat> you'll learn quickly. See, the greatest, the greatest thing about entrepreneurs is how fast can you learn? You know, when you, you look at the seven deadly sins, the biggest tragedy is ego. So ego or van, vain glory is the road straight to hell. And so you gotta, you know, I, I tell you I made mistakes, I tell you I screwed up, I'm definitely on the short list for saint, but you better be honest and people trust you and they better keep your word. You know, you're only as good as your word. Yeah. So action and words must be in integrity. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, a lot of the best businesses have started uh, when, when there was a recession, Correct. right? There was Correct. this idea of, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, I'm sure you're a fan oh, of him. Oh, he is my hero, man. Anti-fragile, stronger, I mean, I diamonds get stuff. stronger, right? Yeah. As, as, as in under pressure. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting concept, but people fear it. People, a lot of people fear it. Yeah, but he's, but you know, his, 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 his lesson is you go to the gym, you get stronger. It hurts for a little while, but you get stronger. Yeah. And people are coming out of school weaker today. And that's what disturbs me, you know. And then, you know, Patrick Bet David, man, he's, Guy, that guy is amazing what he's teaching. Yeah, and so there's many young guys coming up that are teaching brilliant stuff, and that's YouTube. You know, which which um, has a whole new channel, right? Is social media now the channel? So if you're in traditional media, you're in trouble. Mm. But if you're moving with the trends, you're in good good shape right now. Sure, sure. So that's the difference. Well, N Nassim Nicholas Taleb also talks about. Um, uh, in Black Swan, he talks about this idea of the barbell strategy, right? Where he kind of uses like the S and P as like an analogy, where most people think medium. This idea of like putting yourself into medium risk is the safest option, when in fact you're not really getting much of the upside, but you're getting all of the downside as well. So you're allocating risk in a way that is not actually helping you diversify. And you're actually putting yourself in more risk. And he advocates this idea of putting yourself into very risky assets in a small amount, and the rest into, let's say in this case, cash, bonds, and that oh, way- Oh, even bonds are in trouble now. Bonds are, I guess, yeah, so yeah. most likely cash, where it's well, very liquid. When, when I was your age, the smart guys were in bonds, nobody was in stocks. Mm -hmm. Today, everybody's in stocks and bonds, I'm going, holy mackerel. Sure, okay. sure. Yeah. Well, what, well, what are your thoughts on the, this idea of barbell strategy where there is asymmetric returns where, let's say you put 10% into something that's super risky, the maximum you can lose is that 10%, so you still have that 90% still uphold. 
Well, it depends upon the person. Like I'm saying, I, no. I encourage anybody listening to this or any entrepreneur, get to the point where you don't need money. It's called the infinite return. And that's my, my next book coming out next year. Yeah. When you get to the point where you don't need money, you're home free. You'll never need money. You don't care. You, you can always put a deal together. You can always create an asset out of nothing. You know, it's like, I don't know what else. It's the power of God-given power. So like I said, when I write a book, I'm selling 50 copies, 50 licenses, day one. Mm. And let's say I get 10,000 a license. How much is that? 50 times 10,000, 500,000. 50 Not, times 10,000? Yeah. That's yeah, 500,000. Yeah, so I'm in, the, I'm in the black immediately. What does it cost me? Maybe 10,000 to write a book? You know, so I'm in the black. The same thing if I trade a stock, I'll buy a stock at a dollar, it goes up to 10 and I sell. So I have all free trading stock, I have no money in it. That, that's what Buffett's doing. They're all infinite return guys. Sure. You have no money into the deal. And you can do it with anything. What so are other examples that you would recommend? Uh, Stocks, you mentioned books. Well, re real estate, it's my first, my first deal was I bought a uh, condo on the island of Maui for 18,000 bucks and I gave him a credit card to put the 2,000, so $1,800, 10% down payment, and I made 25 bucks for it. Hmm. So I made 25 bucks from no money at all, 100% debt. I love debt. The average guy's afraid of debt. So if you, it's just mindset. It's, it's what you know, how do you practice. Uh, I have made a lot of mistakes. I've never lost money in real estate, hmm. never, because I invest a lot in my financial education in real estate, why? Debt and taxes. The more I can use all the debt I want and pay right. no taxes. I love it, I love it, there's a God somewhere. Why would I buy stocks? I don't understand that game. You can make money quickly. Sure. And stocks are good because they're illiquid. I mean, they're liquid. You can yeah. get out of the stocks real quick and real estate's dangerous because you can't get out of it. But that's why I've got to study more. So anyway, I, I, you know, the biggest thing I can say to any entrepreneur is, is learn. Be an active learner, low ego. Be you know it's it's tough when you're successful. Because when my nylon and vertical surfer wallet business went to the moon, I was crashing down right after it. <laughs> it was straight to my well, head. While the, while the ego was oh, still man, there, was, vanity ego was still there. Yeah, right? it was straight to bed. I, I thought I walked on water. Yeah. Except there was no water. There was only air below me. <laughs> So having I learned the hard way, you know, I don't, I don't learn it easy. Well, having learned that is, is your flow now, is it that you have, you know, talking about ESBI is your flow. Now you have these active businesses, let's say, you know, books or business as well. You use the profits Assets. from that and you invest all of it into real estate. Is that the kind of oh, the no, way no, your money no, flows? No, 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 I only invest in real estate. I, right now I'm out of the real estate market. I mean, I, I still have my real estate holdings, but I'm not aggressively buying because, because the prices are too high because yeah. private equity and the hedge funds went into real estate. And now it makes no, it's, it's like the stock market's a disconnect between the price and the value. So these guys, are, my, my best friend just became a billionaire because he took all of his real estate holdings and sold it to a hedge fund. Mm. He's laughing all the way, so it's, it's gonna crash on him. It's fake valuations. Good it's, timing. Ba yeah. it's, it's based upon today's valuations, maybe not tomorrow's. Interesting. Yeah, so he's, you know, he, he and I had a race who was gonna be first millionaire. I beat him, but he beat me to a billionaire. So his idea is that he sold it to a hedge fund. Once the house market goes crashing down, he's just gonna buy it all back at a Correct. fraction of the price. Correct. Gotcha. gotcha. Because you know, you do you, you know, think about entrepreneurs, you're not you're not manual labor. So you're working with your mind, your body, your spirit and your emotions, you know, you're just sure timing things, observing things. You have to have good friends, people you trust implicitly. Yeah. And like I have fantastic staff. You know, I trust them with, you know, some of my people have been around me for 20 years. My, some of my best partners are 40 years. Mm. You know, we know we trust each other. So that takes time. Yeah. There's also been a lot of crooks along the way. You know, so I'm, like I found out, I won't mention names, but some of my, my CEO and my president were stealing money again. Recently. Mm. They can't sell. They can't sell. You know, my friend uh, was my accountant, Tom Wheelwright. He says, you know, he looks at returns all the time. He says, people who can't sell steal. You're saying they're not actually stealing money, but they're stealing time and valuable resources from you. They're actually stealing money from yeah. you because they're not selling enough, you're saying. They, they don't know how to sell. 
Okay, but they're not actually going in and stealing money from you. Oh, they are. There's so, so many ways you can. Uh, I, I see what you're saying, but you're, you're, I get what you're saying, but yeah, okay. Well, one of the best experiences I had, you know, I was, <laughs> I, was a, I was a young Marine, I was in Hawaii, you know, I still couldn't chase women because I was so shy. Yeah. So I got a job working uh, as a manager of a nightclub in Waikiki. And so it was with the big, back today it's called Weston. I didn't know what it was back then. Sure. So this, the, the general manager comes up and talks to me and says, hey, your PC is too high. I said, what's PC? He says, your pork cup. Somebody's stealing alcohol. Somebody, they're not stealing alcohol, but they're not charging for drinks. He says, catch them. <coughs> uh, for six months, I could not figure it out. I couldn't figure out how the bartenders and the cocktail waitresses were stealing money from me. Hmm. So I told my rich dad that, he says, I told you. I said, what's that? He says, if your bartenders and waitresses are smarter than you, don't get into the business. <laughs> And, and my other friend, I was going to buy a professional team, and he said to me, he says, "You were going to buy a professional team. Yeah, which uh, sport? Uh, baseball. Baseball. Okay. No, just not because I like baseball, but just because the baseball team was in trouble, and I was going to buy it. And so you thought there was money to be made uh, there. Yeah, but, but I do it. I, I do it because I want to learn, not because I'm interested in the team. So I ran the numbers, I ran the process, I found them about the business and all that. And finally, this friend of mine came up to me. And he says, and he's, he's, he's an NBA player for 18 years. He says, I'll give you lesson number one in business. I said, what's that? He says, never invest in a business where the employees make more than you do. <laughs> Interesting. And that's why it didn't work. Yeah. Because the more successful the team got, the more money the employees made. You can never win, he says, until you flip it. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to do that. So anyway, those, you can all, please listen to all you entrepreneurs out there. It's the biggest le learning adventure you can go to go through. Even the bad lessons are good lessons if you have the humility to learn from them. Yeah, I mean, I like your mindset because your your whole thing is you're going into these different projects and you you have this growth mindset. We're talking on growth minds, obviously, but you're always in it to learn something new. Anti fragile. Mm. So that's Nazim Taleb. He said, the moment you go into the unknown, you're getting destabilized, but you're getting sta you're getting stronger. And the average person, they want security and less risk. They're getting stupider and less less fragile, more or fragile. Yeah. So you become anti-fragile when you take you go into the unknown. Sure. And sure. I, I explained that to my company. I said, in my company, I said, I don't care if you make a mistake. I do care if you don't tell me about it. You know. Gotcha. Big difference. Speaking of unstable, we're we're probably in a very fragile market right now, and a lot of people are, in many ways, freaking out. Uh, what do you recommend people do in a market that is potentially heading into depression? Should they be saving cash and thinking about, you know, becoming more liquid? Like, what what are some of the things that they should do? Well, it depends upon the cash. If you're okay. if you're in Argentine is it right, pesos, pesos, or Argentine pesos? pesos, yeah, I wouldn't touch it. I'd save gold and silver. You see, what's what's his name? Uh, what's his hedge, Edgewater's hedge? Oh, Bridgewater's guy. Ray Dalio. Dalio, yeah. He says, it depends upon the currency you're in. Sure. He says, so like Zimbabwe, their debt is financed with external money. Mm. Japan is internally financed. So that's why the depression doesn't hurt them as badly. So you have to learn so much about that. So I own millions and millions and millions and millions and millions in gold, because I started buying gold in 1973 when it was illegal for Americans to own gold. And I like gold and silver because there's no counterparty or risk. There's no other party to it. Gold and silver are God's money. Mm. So people say, well, it's not a good investment. I said, yeah, but I, I, I sleep at night. What's that worth? You know? Sure. So I don't care if the dollar, the, the dollar is corrupt, the US dollar is corrupt, but it's the strongest currency in a horrible currency world. Yeah. So if you're US, save dollars. You're in Argentina. Don't save save gold. Right. Don't save Bitcoin. You think Bitcoin would be? No, I mean, I mean Bitcoin's got got its problems too. But sure. I'm saying, I would. So when you say save money, you gotta say what? What, what currency? Yeah. What currency? Sure. Do you know? It's like the Swiss franc it used to be the strongest currency of all, but now they're backed by the Fang stocks, and so I'm kind of backing off of the Swiss. You know, whatever they franc, whatever they use. 
I don't even know anymore. I just, you know, I just kind of, it's almost instinctive. Sure, sure. I mean, the Argentines, uh, what, what I found interesting was the way we look at gold, because I think you're completely dead on. The way we look at gold and as a way of hedging, the Argentines look at Bitcoin and the way you look, they look at U.S. dollars Correct. as a way to hedge that. Correct. Um, it's so it's I, more stable. I think you're spot on with that. Yeah, for sure. You know what's funny about Canada, though? What? How much gold you guys got? I don't know. A lot, I guess. None. None? Yeah. Canadians are just as silly as the English. But they there's sold, like so much land that... But they have a lot of gold. They sold off their gold. Ah, interesting. So to who? I don't know. They just got rid of their gold. You know? But they have gold in the ground. But it's because, you know, Canada's resource rich. <laughs> but the guys running your country are idiots. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Let's not get into that deep hole. <laughs> we get, Robert, we're going to piss so many people off at this podcast. I mean, no, how many people have we did so far? How far are we going with this? But you got to be smarter than your politicians. You know, like, yeah, this podcast about, is going to be canceled. <laughs> yeah, what about Trump? What about Bernie? Said, what about him? I don't care. You know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. got to be smarter than them. Because well, you're not dependent on them. Yeah. Because, because of infinite yeah, exactly. returns, you're not creating your own assets. Yeah. And so if Bernie says this, if Trump says that, if Biden says this, you're like, okay, good, good, good. Or Yang says this. I still got to be smarter than them with my money because it is my money. Sure. And if you hope, if you're hoping that Trump, if I, you know, Trump's my friend, I'm not counting him to save my money for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I do what he does, but I don't. Do, yeah. I'm not counting on him. Gotcha. And if Andrew Yang wants UBI, Universal Basic Income, that's MMT, you know, Marxist money theory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I look. I think it's I've. I think you got to look at it. It's a comedy show. Yeah. I mean, it pretty, it's a reality show for sure it's with comedy, Trump in there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a gong fest. Oh, it's horrible. It's kind of funny, but. <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got the Donald, you know, on one side, reality show guy. Do you still talk to him, by the way? No, not, not, not. The last time I talked to him, he announced me. He was on my show, my Rich Dad radio show. He says, I'm going to run for president. I said, good for you. I better stand far away from you <laughs> Because all he's a target now. Did you think it was a joke, though? No, no, no. He's a good guy. I mean, you know, he, he says things he shouldn't say. He, right, he right. Spe- he, no I mean, two, he could be a good guy, but also... There's no this, two this Donald idea. Trumps. He is exactly as you see him. And he shouldn't tweet and all that. Yeah, well, I'll agree with that. Mm. But I'm not, I'm not into politics. So yeah. I, I listen to Bernie Sanders. I give the guy a lot of credit. You know what I mean? To <laughs> admit to be a socialist in America. <laughs> as Mexican friends would say, big cojones. <laughs> And Pete, and Pete Buttigieg, you know, a gay guy, you know, and all this, and going, you know, I don't know if he's a husband or the wife, but you gotta have, you gotta, <laughs> have, you gotta have, you gotta have such guts. And then Andrew Yang, I'm gonna give everybody money. I'm going, thank you. To catch Whereas, it, to catch know, a headline, no? Yeah, I know. I, I watch all this stuff. It's a TV show, as far as I'm concerned. But if you you're counting on them, you're a bigger idiot than they are, you know. So, and then Pocahontas, I just love her, you know. She, like, how, how did that happen, you know? Rob, you're sounding like a real Republican right now. I'm not a Republican. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cartoon yes. commentator. I yeah. think it's hysterical. You're just observing this, this whole scenery, Yeah, basically. but I still have millions in gold, and I still have my real estate. I'm still offshore in many things, and I don't pay any taxes Jesus. legally. Yeah. So I can laugh. If you're not there yet, you can't laugh. But I wouldn't count on those guys to save my ass. Right. Do, do, that's all I'm saying. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's going to be the biggest adventure of your life as long as you want to keep learning. But if you just want to make a few bucks, you'll be taxed to death. Yeah. That's the S quadrant, E-S-B-I. That's the problem. And as you know, small business loans and all, they don't give you any money. It's hard to raise capital as an S. Sure. You know, crowdfunding, all that stuff, but... I'd rather go to Wall Street. I'd rather <coughs> raise my own capital. Yeah. But those are skill sets. So I say to every entrepreneur, look at it as the biggest education plan you'll ever go through. You know, I don't care if you're a college degree or not, but you better you better learn really quickly, fast, have good people around you, and keep studying. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, Rob, let me let me end off because I know you came in because you wrote this book called "Who Stole My Pension." <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about what people don't know about pensions today, what the average person does not understand about how pensions work today? Well, the pensions are bankrupt, they're gone. You know, the, my father, my, my poor dad worked for the government and he lost his pension in 1972. And he still told me to go and get a job and all that. So he, my poor dad became a poor man 
when he lost his job, his paycheck, and his pension. How did he lose it? Like he just got He nothing. ran against the governor. See, the governor was a crook. Hmm. John Burns, police officer. If you read the book, Sunny Sky, Shady Characters, you'll find out exactly this. this he's an investigative report. I forget his name now. But he said everything my father was saying to me. Hmm. They're all buddies. This, it, Shady Sky, Sunny Characters starts with Don Ho. Nice Don Ho. They were all in cahoots. Supreme Court justices were all in cahoots with Kamehameha schools, the most richest school system in America for Hawaiian kids. Yeah. And all these estates just ripping people off. So my father, after he became the governor's staff, resigned. And he said, I cannot, in good conscience, ethically, morally, and legally, I cannot be part of your staff. So he made the mistake of running against him. This is while I was in Vietnam, you know, defending the country from I don't know who. But anyway. I come home and my father's bankrupt. He's bankrupt. No pension, no paycheck, no pen, no, uh, no job. And he's still telling me to go back to school, get my PhD. I said, I'll wind up like you. He said, go fly for the airlines. He read who stole my pensions. My guys, my friends who flew for United, they're all broke. Nobody knows this. Right, but wh why is this, is this happening to everyone that has a all pension? All over the world. Okay. It says back here on the back of who stole my pension. What's America's number one export? Toxic assets. Derivatives. Still manufacturing. Subprime so mortgages, yeah. Yep, subprime so mortgages. So is there stuff that, because my mom's a nurse and she's under a pension plan, the union members are, for people that are on, or like are relying on pensions or have family members or, or friends that are on pensions, what can they do oh, that's to what, actually That's how I wrote the step. book. Because yeah. not all pensions are bad, but Understand CalPERS, which is the biggest state pension plan in, um, in America, it's California state teachers. They're one trillion underfunded. The reason people are evacuating California right now is because they know California is about to go bankrupt because of pensions. So if CalPERS goes down, so does the stock market goes down, so does the, so it goes the 401k. So this coronavirus is one thing, but it's really a house of cards or a set of dominoes ready to start to fall. And it all went back to 1971, the year Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, and we could print funny money. And yeah. we're still printing funny money. Yeah. So the rich are getting richer if you're playing that game of investing, and the poor and middle class are getting poorer. Yeah, the, th the first thing that I um, realized where things start to look a little bit backwards when it comes to pension fund money is that, because I'm in, I'm in the tech world, so when someone that's in venture capital, private equity, they want to go raise their fund, first thing they go to is pension. So it's it's a little bit backwards because people are giving money into a pool, that's goes into a pension fund. That's the book. And you got it. they go you got and it. give money you got to it. other managers you got to it. manage the you money. You got it. You got it. So like, you got do, it. W but what do they do? Like, what do people do? Like, what does my mom do to make sure she's protected? Is, there, is she just completely helpless in this state? I what can't. you can do is what you can do. I hate to be flippant about what you can do, what you can do. Sure. Say if, if, you could tra if you're a stock trader, you understand how to short, short the market and play the options market, you're in hog's heaven. You know, when this baby starts coming down, like right now, a lot of guys are making more money as it crashes. You make more money on a market crash, but if you don't have that skill set, you're in trouble. So develop the skill set, well, you educate yourself. What can, yeah, what do you want to learn how to do? I don't recommend it, that's yeah. hard. Yeah. So I saw this coming back in 72 when I came back from Vietnam. I went, oh my God, you know. And my, then my poor dad said to go back to school, get my PhD. I said, poor, helpless, and desperate. And I couldn't listen to him anymore. And that's, you know, we started this whole thing of our fathers and our families. And, and then the other thing I don't say is that we have, my poor dad was Japanese. My rich dad was Chinese. They're two different people. <laughs> I mean, look at the you know what I'm look talking at, look about? At the economy, right? Yeah. No, no, no. It's Chinese. It's oh, you're talking Koreans about culture? Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, talking. Yeah. I'm being a racist right now. <laughs> it's a broad generalization. Sure. Yeah. But you know, you know, every race has its characteristic, and we're not being racist. I'm just saying that's it's culture. Culture. Yeah. And I understand it because I'm Korean. Yeah. So, no, I understand. And you what came you're from saying, Korea. And you, I came from Korea. You have from two. You have two points of view. The three: yeah. Canadian, U.S., and 
Career. Well, I live in Mexico City right now, so I've got. Oh, I've got f- You're yeah, ahead a couple, of the game. Couple different ones yeah, right you're now. You're ahead of the game, and that's that's really that's the best thing you can do. Right. You know, yeah. you're you're doing something I didn't do, so it's good for you. No. But I mean, answer the question: What can the person do? You can do what you can do, or you will learn to do. Sure. Yeah. And it's different for different people. That's why I say, I'm not I'm not poli- I'm not politically correct, as you can tell. I'm not Republican or Democrat. I think Trump's kind of a clown too. You know. Well, I think that's why people like your book. You go, you go straight into the point, and it's refreshing because of everything else that you read in the media is super fluffy, super up in the clouds, and it's positive, it's very positive, which is helpful for some people, but it's not really going to help them get it done. And it seems like your book is focused on a very specific type of person that's willing to go through the difficulties of, of making mistakes, taking that risk, and obviously it's sold 31, probably 50 million copies, um, because of the fact that it provides a lot of education, but the people that are actually going to take action are probably going to be a fraction of the people. So exactly. really the people listening, the, the, you need to understand if you're the type of person that can apply the things that you've, you've taught if you, them. If you're listening to this p- broadcast about entrepreneurship, you have a better chance yeah. than somebody in their MBA program at McGill because your mindset's different already. Sure, absolutely. It's mindset to start. Absolutely. So if I can tell you one more thing about your race, the Koreans. Yeah. The reason I, you know, we're talking about Taekwondo and I fought for the U.S. team in the Olympics, mm. Taekwondo. So that was all fair. You can talk, talk to the people about that. You yeah, so were talking about right? He said, you're from Korea. I said, oh, come some it up. <laughs> and it's because, that's, what does that mean? <laughs> Hello, mean, right? It means thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even know. Poli- it's a polite way to say thank you, too. Okay. There's like polite, you know, okay. Japanese, like same thing. So how do you know that? So because I took up Taekwondo. Why did I take Taekwondo? because I was standing in Vietnam as a 19-year-old kid, and these people called rock marines when driving by, rock says Republic of Korea. And people were dodging, running from these guys. I said, who are those guys? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like Butch Cass and the Sundance Kid. Who are those guys? He says, they're rock marines. And I said, what's so good about them? He says, they can, they can kill anybody with nothing. And the, the legend that went ahead the PR, the public went ahead of the Rock Marines. There are stories of these guys, the Viet Cong would tie them up, and they still kill them while they were tied up. And I said, how'd they do that? He said, well, they didn't tie their feet up. I went, what? Ta- which is Taekwondo, yeah. Taekwondo is all, all forms, legs, all, you know, kicking. So I, t- I stuck that on my back on my head, so I went to watch the Rock Marines train when they, these guys, they have no feelings. Mm. They're just tough, tough. They make great entrepreneurs, though, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're nasty. They're, they're not good guys, but, you know, they're, they're tough. They just go in. So I came back to the States, and I took up Taekwondo. And I still suck at it, but, you know, I, I took it up. And you have a black belt, Rob. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Well, American black belt versus, oh, you know what I mean? I see, I see. I see. That, 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 there's a difference there's between a difference. American black belt and Taekwondo <laughs> and a yes, Korean yes, black sir. belt and Taekwondo, you know? So yeah. I got over there and I, I fight for them for America. Good for I you, got though. My That's butt, amazing that you I got that. my butt handed. Well, let me explain to you. I was a heavyweight, which means I was fat in America. In Korea, they're tall and skinny like you. Yeah. And Koreans in Taekwondo is about the legs, really. They could, li- it's called a chiki or the hammer. They could lift the leg straight over their heads. And they stand there on one leg and th- they just watch you. Because so imagine the guy, he looks like this leg in the air. Yeah. And I'm this little fat guy trying to come up. <laughs> you know, how do I find an opening? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, no, you're, like, you're like, you can barely get up here. <laughs> I, c- I can't lift my legs. Yeah. So. <laughs> I get into the ring. I said, this is not fair, but, but, but he's a heavyweight, but he's a skinny heavyweight. Right, but his legs are like. No, no, really, he's tall. Mm. He was like six foot four. His legs were probably eight feet high. In the, I don't know how high he was up in the air. I couldn't come in on him. So I made the mistake. I said, well, no guts, no glory. I jumped in on that leg, came across my head, and I was out. <laughs> I didn't have a prayer. Jesus. What we're talking about was just like Karate Kid. There was one guy who was watching the tournament, this Korean guy. He didn't speak much English, and I didn't speak, speak any Korean. He says, you got potential. And he took me out into the country, and for two weeks, he trained me. Mm. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Yeah. And when I came back to the States, I kicked ass. Because mm. I was trained in Korean Taekwondo, not American Taekwondo. Yeah. And I was trained by a real fighter, 
not uh, you know guy was pretty good, but he wasn't he was not a real fighter. Sure, it's a different standard when you hang around with a certain type of people. I feel the same way. Like I was when I was six or seven, my dad would teach me division and multiplication, and I got to Canada when I was seven, and they were doing subtraction and addition. Yeah, it's just a different level. Yes, it's cultural. Yeah. Yes, and it's the mindset and all that. So it's a lot. So I said this whole thing is should you be an entrepreneur? Well, a lot has to do with what your family said about it. Mm. You know, my poor dad always said the rich were crooks, entrepreneurs were crooks, the rich were greedy. School, all you had to do was have a college degree, you were set. Different cultures. Yeah, and I had to go against it, all that, especially respecting the father. So writing rich dad and poor dad, whoo man. That's why I said he had to die before I wrote that book because he would have <laughs> killed me. <laughs> well, well, listen, Rob, I, I commend you just because I, I understand culturally what you had to go through from your father, from your mother. I understand the family background. So to have unlearned a lot of the things that you had to do, particularly at an older age for you, right? It wasn't, yep. it wasn't like me when I was seven. And, and to, to see how you've been able to educate hundreds of millions of people at this point is um, it, it was really an honor to to come talk to you. Uh, we leave the audience with one small but actionable step that they can do after they listen to this episode, whether it's a specific book you could recommend, whether it's a, an action step that they can take to get that one step further to start their business or, or you know, in their investment or anything that they you think they can really help uh, improve their lifestyle. What do you think that would be? I just talked to one of my best friends. He, he's my real estate guy, Ken McElroy. He, he says, he and I are going to stop doing talks at universities. Mm. Wrong. Why is that? Well, it's the wrong audience, wrong message. Sure. He says, I just came, I won't mention it in the university. He says it was horrible. <laughs> and he's a good guy. He's very smart you know, and all this. And what he said to the students, he says, your education begins when you leave school. What you learn means nothing. Uh -oh. <laughs> That did not go well at the university, too. Yeah. He says, most Jesus. of these school teachers don't know it. He didn't say it that way, but I've said it that way. You know, I, I, I took the cash flow game once, Mike. This is how we teach accounting fast, is playing games, because yeah. accounting is the most boring subject possible. I took it into a school system. We had like 10 tables. We had five entrepreneurs at one table and five teachers at the other table. Then we had high school kids at each table. The tables were, the teachers were, there was no fun. Mm. The kids were sleeping, they were bored, they hated it and all this. And the, te the tables where the entrepreneurs were teaching, those kids were screaming and yelling, having a good time. And the people that hated my cash flow game the most was the economics teacher and the accounting teacher. Because they were most at risk no, as well. They didn't understand it. Oh, at all? Mm. Not at all. The accounting teacher looked up in a dictionary, she said, well, this is not the definition for an asset in my book, and I said, yeah, and that's why you're a school teacher. Life isn't found in a book. You know, so they haven't invited me back either. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, we'll always have you back. Well, thank it's always you. a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Keep learning, all you guys. Keep all keep Most learning, guys. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, tune in for next week. Thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. Thank you. I'm and for giving pleasure. us a straight suit interview. Tune in for next time, guys.